I'm joining you as Acting Prime Minister today, while the Prime Minister is in, on her way to Europe for her third trade mission this year, to help support an economic recovery and assist in securing a new free trade agreement with the European Union. This week the House is sitting and it will be another busy week. Earlier today, Minister Allen announced improvements to our political donation laws that will promote greater transparency around anonymous donations and ensure that New Zealanders overseas who have not been able to return home due to COVID-19 are able to vote in next year's election. In the House this week, we will see further progress on important legislation, including the passing of the supermarket bill to end the anti-competitive land wars that stop uh, competitors from our duopoly from setting up shops, tackling one of the root causes of higher food prices in New Zealand. We're also planning the first readings of the Māori electoral option legislation, the UK Free Trade Bill and the Smoke-Free Environments Bill. And on Friday, the 1st of July, Health New Zealand, the Māori Health Authority and the Ministry for Disabled People will all officially come into existence. This is a significant moment for our country as we stand up a fully national health service that will ensure that no matter where you are in the country, you can access the high quality health services that New Zealanders deserve. A number of other income support measures kick in from July the 1st as well, including increases to paid parental leave payments and rates rebates. Today, I can announce that Cabinet has confirmed a further package of measures to support Ukraine's self-defence in the face of Russia's unprovoked and illegal invasion. We will be contributing a further $4.5 million to the NATO Trust Fund for priority non-lethal military supplies. This includes items like military first aid kits, fuel, communications equipment and rations. This funding is on top of the $4.2 million that we contributed to the NATO Fund in March. The Government is also extending current deployments of New Zealand Defence Force Intelligence, Logistics and Liaison Officers in the UK, Germany and Belgium. The deployment of six NZDF intelligence analysts to the UK and the use of New Zealand-based open source intelligence capability to support partner intelligence requirements will be extended by five months to November 30th, along with the deployment of a further six NZDF intelligence analysts to the UK. We're also extending the deployment of four NZDF logistics specialists in Germany by two months until August 31, and two NZDF liaison officers to Belgium and the UK by five months to November 30, and we'll be adding an additional liaison officer to Germany for the next two months. The decision to extend and enhance these deployments demonstrates our strong commitment to Ukraine's self-defence and to delivering support in close coordination with our international partners. This increases in response to requests from our international partners and opportunities that have been identified by New Zealand diplomatic and defence officials since Cabinet made our initial decision to deploy personnel in March. On a related note, the RNZAF um, C-130 Hercules and personnel that were deployed to Europe in support of Ukraine have completed their mission and returned to New Zealand yesterday. While in Europe, the aircraft was based at RAF Bryce Norton in the United Kingdom. Crew on the Hercules were assigned consignments, transporting, transporting donated military equipment and stores, including medical stores, between staging points in Europe from where the aid was then taken into Ukraine. During its deployment, crew on the Hercules carried out 62 flights, transporting 256,000 kilograms of military aid. I'd like to thank the returning personnel for their hugely significant contribution in support of Ukraine's self-defence. The deployment of personnel to train Ukraine's service personnel on the L119 light gun in the UK is scheduled to be completed shortly, with personnel returning next month. I'm also announcing today the secondment of a specialist New Zealand senior military investigator to the International Criminal Court to support the legal case against Russia's invasion of Ukraine and new funding of a million dollars to the Trust Fund for Victims. Today's support adds to the more than $33 million in direct funding that New Zealand has provided to date, alongside trade and economic sanctions that have limited Russia's ability to finance and equip the war and the provision of military hardware and personnel. This commitment demonstrates New Zealand's complete support for the people of Ukraine, our allegiance to those nations who are also acting against Putin's illegal war. And I want the people of Ukraine to know that they can continue to rely on sustained support from New Zealand, 
all points I know that the Prime Minister will take with her on her visit to Europe. Happy to take your questions. Deputy Prime Minister, it was Nanaima who to... And uh, against the decision. As I say, Minister Mahuda is the person you'll need to to talk about that. She has dealt with this issue in accordance with her conscience, and no doubt she has reasons for the views she's articulated. I'm standing. I'll finish. I'm standing up here today on behalf of the Prime Minister to say that the Labour Party continues to support women in New Zealand to be able to access abortion services and to have reproductive rights. We passed the legislation. It was a government bill and I stand by what we're doing here. Everybody in New Zealand knows what Jacinda Ardern's position is on this issue and what the Labour Party's position is. Is she is. tweeting in her a personal capacity or, or was she tweeting as the Foreign Minister of New Zealand? On issues such as this, the Labour Party has adopted conscience position. She tweeted. I, again, you would have to ask her that. Can you add on and just further to the point, some members though? of the public Wouldn't will see that as hypocritical? Oh, look, as I say, we have always had members in the Labour Party who have uh, taken conscience positions on this, but this was a government bill that decriminalised abortion. We had never had that. Jacinda Ardern in the 2017 election campaign stood up and said that was what we would do. It was Labour Party policy to make it a health issue, and we delivered on that. What we do have, however, in the opposition, is a leader of the opposition who has said in the past that he thinks that abortion is tantamount to murder. He has now spun two different positions over the weekend. We've got Simon O'Connor and Simeon Brown, even in this last 24 to 48 hours, not supporting the right to abortion services in New Zealand. So, yep. We will always have conscience votes on these matters, but the Labour Party and the government has driven the change in this area. Right, Robinson, you're talking you about national, how you're trying people to... would see that as hypocritical. Well, I was going to say, people will take that however they want. Minister Mahuda can explain why she um, has taken the position she has in the past. I'm explaining to you what our position as a party is. But you, you say that, though, but you are then calling into question national and telling New Zealanders that they can't tr be trusted on their position on abortion. Are you not politicising the distress that women are feeling at the moment? No, not at all. What I am doing is pointing to the record that we had of introducing legislation to decriminalise abortion and to make sure that women get easier access to abortion services. We have done that. Um, you know, in America, you have a generation of women who thought that this issue was settled. And what we have here is an opposition leader who clearly has a view that he holds on this, which he is now spinning to say that he promises not to take away those rights. We know what Jacinda Ardern's position is here, and we know what Christopher Luxon's position is here. What we are doing, though, is politicising what people, the distress that people are feeling about the Supreme Court in New, uh, decision here in New Zealand. Well, I don't agree with that. What I'm stating is what we have done, and what I'm doing is also looking at the words that I have seen said by those in the opposition. Look. It's great news if that is what Christopher Luxon says he's going to do, but I could also understand why people might be sceptical about that, given what he has said in the past, given that over half of his caucus actually voted against that bill. 
We have a conscience vote in Parliament, but the Labour Party is the party that introduced decriminalisation. Prime Minister, when she was overseas in the US, didn't go anywhere near the issue of um, gun control. In fact, stayed very away from it. Why has she waded into this debate so strongly, given it's a US domestic issue? Well, I think the comments I saw from the Prime Minister in the weekend were couched in the language of human rights, and that these are rights that women in New Zealand will look across to the United States and see them as human rights that they feel women there should have as women here do as well. So that was the, the way in which the Prime Minister characterised her comments. Anna. Can, um, can the public trust National, do you think, to uphold um, this commitment that they won't make any changes to abortion laws? Well, the question the National Party have to answer is what if there is a private members bill? Is this something where the National Party will now deny a conscience vote to their members? We know from the language that Christopher Luxon has used in the past that he thinks that abortion is tantamount to murder. He put out two statements in two days in the weekend because he clearly was concerned that his real views were going to get through to New Zealanders. What we have now is a Labour Party that's actually acted to decriminalise abortion and a National Party that's promising not to take people's rights away. I think people can judge the difference in those two things. In this post in the weekend, um, I it was, it was quite a um, hefty post about some of the concerns you've had recently over political discourse and um, you know, violence. What, can you tell us some of the reasons behind why you posted that and why at that time? Oh, look, I'd been reflecting um, myself about the decision um, in America. I have two nieces who both live in the United States. Um, I think a lot of people around the world have spent some time reflecting on what many of us thought was a settled um, piece of law and rights that women in America had, and that disappeared. And I do link it in some ways to the growth of bigotry and racism that we've seen um, in different parts of the world. And I did reflect on an incident that happened to me um, a week or two back in Danny Vert, um, which was pretty unpleasant. Uh, and I just think, as, as I tried to conclude in that post, uh, that actually I think New Zealand is in a good place on these issues. I think that we can lead the way. Uh, but we've got to stand up to these sorts of things. And whether it's directed at you personally or people you know or women or Māori, we should stand up to it. And that was the point I was trying to make. Deputy Professor, um, what, does it sort of, what, what do you think it says about the sort of quality of parliamentary debate, I guess, um, that, you know, we're having this big discussion about Roe v Wade, obviously very legitimate, but, you know, recently we heard that half of um, suicide is the leading cause of death for half of pregnant women and half of those are Māori. Um, you know, we've got horrendous maternal suicide rates, that sort of thing, doesn't get, get very little debate. Mm. Um, yeah, look, I mean, we should concern ourselves with the health and well-being of all New Zealanders, and especially those, you know, pregnant women, we, we consider that constantly. When today we've been talking about access to, to vaccines and so on. We, we want to make sure that we are supporting good quality maternal health. I know that Minister Verrill, it's a particular interest area of hers, and she wants to make sure we continue to work on those issues. We should be having good debates about those things, as we should be about these sorts of, of issues that are important to the value set of many, many New Zealanders. The verbal attack on you and threat in Danny Burke, have you seen that sort of instance, those instances increase for yourself personally? Have you had to readjust your security settings at all? I certainly have seen an increase in the amount of threats that myself and others have received. And I want to make clear uh, for people the likes of the Prime Minister, this is a far worse situation than what I've faced. Um, I've certainly seen it since um, we had the occupation in front of Parliament. Uh, the people who were involved in the incident most recently with me were people who had been here at that incident. Um, and so, yeah, we've had to you know, think again about security arrangements and make sure that we, we do our best to to be looked after. And I do want to note that the New Zealand Police were present that day in Danny Burke, and I'm very grateful for their help that day. Was the person spoken to by police after that? I'm not sure. I presume they probably were. Yeah, the police were obviously there, and they know exactly who the person was. I should clarify that was said to me as I was leaving the meeting um, and being followed and shouted and abused by those people. On the further um, support that you've announced for Ukraine, um, is it your, the, the, the government's hope that this sort of New Zealand's ongoing and significant contribution to support to Ukraine will be recognised by the EU member states and hopefully will influence the outcome of this FTA? 
Oh, well, that's not why we're doing it. I mean, we're doing this because, as we've said from the beginning, um, the people of Ukraine have been subject to an illegal invasion uh, by Russia, and they need our help and our support, as many, many nations around the world have been providing. Um, we value the relationships we have in the European Union. We share a lot of values, and so it's important for us in situations like this to do the right thing. The free trade negotiations are separate to that. Uh, they've been ongoing for some time, uh, and we continue to be at the table to get the best outcomes we can. But our role in the Ukraine is simply about doing the right thing. And just on the, um, the fentanyl that's been found detected in the white powder, how concerned are you um, with the news that, that fentanyl's in the country? Oh, look, I'm very concerned whenever we have a situation where, where people are, find themselves unwell or, in this case, even hospitalised as a result of the drugs that they take. Um, we really urge people to make sure they know what substances they're taking. We have made changes to enable people to have drugs tested more easily, uh, and we need to make sure, firstly, that people aren't using those drugs, but secondly, that if they are, that, um, that they understand the importance of being extremely careful and obviously making sure that we've got um, uh, a supply of the drugs that are needed to counteract the effects. Well, now the Drug Foundation says that we're grossly underprepared for a fentanyl outbreak, calling for more funding for tests and life-saving medicines. So is there anything the government will do on that? Well, I'm not aware of any concern about the availability. I think it's of naloxone, which is the, the, the drug that counteracts the effects of fentanyl. Um, the advice we've had is there is no concern about the supply of that and the availability of it. Uh, but we will continue to make sure that we provide services uh, to, make, to keep New Zealanders safe in these situations. Lieutenant Robertson, just on the um, electoral changes proposed this morning, they're obviously being framed up as um, increasing trust and confidence um, in donations and in greater transparency. I'm just interested in your viewpoint. Obviously, the, the Ministry of Justice consultation document talked about um, bringing candidates and parties in line with each other, dropping it down to $1,500 donations. It's, it's obviously only come down as far as 5000 um, and then the other issue as well is around the um, reporting. Whilst you've moved the 30,000 amount down to 20,000, at the moment it's having to uh, disclose within 10 days of receipt, but that's moving to only annually in the two years that aren't election year, which actually means that you're being transparent about those donations fewer times over three years than you would be otherwise. Can you just talk me through how it improves transparency and gives greater trust and confidence when those two things seem to be the opposite? Well, I don't... Oh, I don't think the first one is... I mean, the first one is definitely a significant improvement on where we are in terms and of... And it hasn't gone as far. Yeah, as it, it hasn't gone as far. So going to $5,000 is a significant improvement. My understanding is that the advice from officials uh, was that as we went, you go further and further down, the administrative uh, burden and costs of having to go through and identify all of those people starts to counterbalance the value of what you're doing. So officials' advice was that $5,000 set somewhere around uh, uh, an achievable uh, improvement that wasn't an unnecessary administrative burden on political parties. So that was a balance uh, situation there. In terms of the change around the thirty to $20,000, look, my understanding is there was an, an agreement that we needed the amount to be less, that the most important uh, time period for that obviously was in and around elections, and the 10-day uh, disclosure uh, period within the election gives you um, that, and that's the time at which people will be the most concerned and the most focused on it, and so that was the reason for it. Does that mean, though, because you still have that discrepancy between the 1500 and the 5000 and the rules are different, obviously, for candidates versus parties, are you still going to run into those same problems of the party collecting and then sort of transferring um, to candidates under sort of, you know, headquarters or whatever because you don't have the same sort of rules apply? Yeah, look, again, it's difficult because people might, will tend to to want to potentially donate more to a party than to a candidate because a party is a, a bigger entity. Um, it's 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 a, it has greater costs that it needs to undertake. And so, you know, what we were trying to do was make that uh, uh, more transparent and make that fairer whilst also not affecting individual candidates. And then you've got the issue that not all candidates are members of parties, and so the distinction between the two was maintained uh, in part for that reason. Do you think it's gone? Do you think these changes go far enough, or do you think it will still leave some New Zealanders wondering about who or what is actually 
paying for politicians in elections? I think it's a significant improvement, and I think is in the time available to us to make sure we could put these changes in place for the 2023 election. I think we've, you know, it, it is a job well done. There is, of course, the wider independent review that's already underway in terms of broader uh, electoral law. Um, that's due to report at the end of next year, and that will be able to look at some other issues. But in order to do something that we could pass and get through uh, for the 2023 election, I think we've achieved that. Can I just quickly ask a slightly same theme, different topic, transparency. Um, Paul Eagle obviously this morning um, announced his, his bid. Um, what's your sense of whether it's appropriate, I guess, for him to remain the Rangatai MP for three months, but effectively not be fulfilling that role? Yeah, look, um, there's plenty of history of this. Um, Phil Goff, Christine Fletcher, Jim Anderton, um, I believe they all, you know, served out their term and then once they were elected, they, you know, they resigned and there was a by-election. Yeah. Well, what it, what it means is that people are able to manage this and my understanding is Mr Eagle does intend to continue to provide constituency services during that period of time uh, and, you know, those of us who are around him will continue to provide support as well. So, you know, this is not an unusual thing. Uh, and I think, you know, you know, Mr Eagle will make a great Mayor of Wellington and I hope that he gets there. There's been, Prime Minister. There's been, regarding the recent Christchurch murder, this alleged offender was under the care of uh, our mental health services. There have now been a number of stabbings um, of strangers by people with mental health issues. Is the public at greater risk because of failings by our mental health system? Oh, look, I think there's an enormous number of assumptions that you've made in that question, and I'm not really in a position to comment on the specific circumstances of this person. Uh, I think that would be unwise anyway, given that there will no doubt be uh, court action that follows from this. Speaking more generally... Um, New Zealand continues to have good quality health services. There is no doubt that we are, have a long-standing legacy of underinvestment in mental health generally, but we do continue to provide good quality services and safety for the public on any individual situation. I'd be very careful about commenting people um, come under care for a variety of reasons, they then leave care for a variety of reasons. I don't know what the circumstances are here. reports of people um, still practicing conversion practices despite it being banned in New Zealand. Have you heard about this and are you surprised that it's still going on? I did read an article today about an individual who said that he intended to carry on with those practices. Um, clearly, if he um, goes ahead in the way that I think he intends to, he would be in breach of the law and so there would be consequences for that. I think it's really important to remember that what we were seeking to ban here were the practices uh, that um, attempted to change somebody's sexuality, to convert them, as it were. What we want to encourage, though, is good quality counselling services to be available to people as they work through issues to do with sexuality or gender or, or anything else for that matter. So good quality counselling services we're all for, people who want to continue to change somebody's gender or sexuality um, and go out to do that with intent will be breaching the law. Uh, Minister, the cost of um, importing petrol is continuing to rise. It hit um, another record high according to the latest data released on Friday. Uh, are you considering extending that um, tax discount? I uh, haven't changed my position on that since the last time you asked me, Janae. Uh, um, obviously, we've already announced extensions um, through to August, which is you know the period we're in now. We continue to monitor the situation. Equally, from the 1st of August, we have uh, the new cost of living payment coming in uh, and you know other supports are still available. But we haven't uh, made a decision about that, but we are obviously aware of the situation and continue to monitor it. Can we infer from your answer referencing the payment that uh, perhaps the, the tax cut will stop and, and the payment will kick in. Um, you shouldn't infer anything from my answer other than what I said. Um, when can we expect an update on um, social insurance? Uh, soon. Um, Cabinet is con continuing to consider uh, the submissions that have come in. Uh, we've been talking with our social partners, with Business New Zealand and the Council of Trade Unions, about those submissions and about uh, our next steps. And uh, obviously we have a timetable to keep to in order to be able to introduce the legislation um, and pass it next year, as we intended. Um, so we'll update you once Cabinet has gone through that process. Those submissions that, that closed at the end of April, um, why have they not been put online yet so we can see what people think about income insurance? It's not unusual when the government does a consultation process that um, the submissions um, are released at a date 
um, some time after they've been put in place. Uh, the government needs to take its time to consider them. Um, MB will be responsible for putting them up. They will definitely be published. It's just a question of timing. Have you asked MB not to put them up right now? No. On fentanyl again, a victim's, a victim's father sorry, is calling for the government to take an incredibly hard line with suppliers and dealers of the drug, like murder charges of deaths occurred. Do you support that? Well, I certainly support making sure that we crack down on people who do deal in illegal drugs, and obviously that's been a focus for the New Zealand police in recent times, and we've seen a number of busts um, around um, people who do supply um, we obviously are taking an approach with those who use where we're trying to get a harm minimisation situation. Uh, but when it comes to those who supply, absolutely we should crack down on them. In a recent poll shown Kiwi support changes to the drug laws to a health-based approach. Any chance of that happening? Well, indeed, that's my point I'm making, is we have been moving more towards health-based approaches over the last few years. The New Zealand police were among those who wanted us to do that. When it goes comes to those low-level uh, offences, for use, um, we want initially to take a health-based approach. Uh, when it comes to those who deal in supply, though, that is a very, very different matter. Thanks, everyone.